You have GarageBand, so what is it going to take to make your audio recordings compete with the pros? You know that they have DAWs such as Pro Tools, Cubase, Logic, Reaper, Studio One, Luna, and more, all at their disposal. Well, you'll quickly find out that it's not the DAW that you have available to you, but the way that you use the tools that you have available that makes your production quality great. We're gonna break down key terms in ways that are easy to understand and get you up and running in GarageBand in no time. When you first launch GarageBand, you're gonna be presented with this screen. I'm going to suggest that for most of you, you should start with an empty project as you see here. That's going to allow you to select your own parameters and your own types of tracks that you wanna work with which will be more important later on. You have this learn to play function, which we're not gonna bother with at this point. If you're creating many tracks in GarageBand, you'll find that recent is actually really important because you'll be able to go through a list of all your recent projects. On this computer, I haven't created any new projects yet. There's also this project templates page. And be careful here. A lot of people will get hung up on the idea that if they're going to be using keyboards, they need to select keyboard collection, or if they're gonna be using guitars, they need amp collection. All of this stuff can be added later on if you just go to New Project and go to Empty Project. So once again, I would start with Empty Project. Realize that everything I'm about to show you on this page can be changed at a later point in your session. You have your tempo, which is how fast your song moves, or the beats per minute. And you also have the ability to tap the tempo here with a mouse or a trackpad, which could be really useful, especially if you're trying to find a way to make your song fit the beat of another song and you don't know the exact tempo. You could select your key signature here and major or minor. Most people don't actually need to be concerned with that unless you're using loops that will adapt to the key. For most of you, you're not gonna to need to worry about your key signature. Your time signature, however, is going to be really important. Make sure you know your time signature, especially if you're gonna be working with virtual instruments, drummers, and loops. Most important is at the bottom. You have your input device and your output device. Most of the time, your input device and output device will be the same. For those of you that are not using any sort of external microphones, you'll select MacBook Pro microphone and MacBook Pro speakers. However, for those of you using external input devices, such as a USB microphone or an audio interface, you'll find that here. At this point, we could go to choose and open our new project. We're now presented with this screen. And once again, just like the old screen, if you select something incorrectly here, you could always delete that and put the correct track in later on. Let's start with the drummer track. By hovering over any of these icons, you can not only see what each one of them does, but some of the shortcuts. For instance, the first one on the left is our library. I could open and close it by clicking it, or I could use the letter Y to open and close it. And I would know that by hovering over it and seeing library is letter Y. Let's close this for now. Let's also close the bottom of the page so that we're not so concerned with the drummer region. You'll quickly find that's our editors region and the letter E could close that. So I could use the letter E or I could click on the scissors to open and close it. Go up to the top where it says GarageBand, click on it and go to preferences. We're not gonna focus on too much here, but there are a few things I wanna talk about. If you click on audio MIDI, you could change those audio devices in case you made a mistake earlier on while setting them. And if you click on the advanced tab, we have something really important. Make sure that your audio recording resolution is at 24-bit. For our purposes, let's just say that 24-bit gives more dynamic range. It basically allows our louds and softs to be more drastic, just like they are in the real world. It's also fine to auto-normalize, which puts your projects at full volume when they export so that they don't sound too soft. Okay, let's close this and get started with some audio, because that's where the fun is. We want to hear our drummer region, so let's hit spacebar. And to stop it, we could hit spacebar once again. If for some reason you forgot that, it's easy. Just click the play button at the top, which is the triangle. And then click the square next to it to stop it. The way GarageBand works is we'll have all of our tracks listed here on the left. So for instance, if I wanted to create a new audio track to record my voice with the drums, I could click this plus sign on the top left and select audio for an audio track. I'm gonna hit create. And once again, we see the library open up. Let's close that again on the top left. And I wanna rename my audio to voice. Let's also close our smart controls, which is this knob here at the top. Now in my head, I like to think about the voice being 
first in my session, so I'm just going to click voice and drag it up on top of the drums. By doing this, we're just organizing it in a different way. So I can now record my voice on this top part if I wanted. Now let's try adding some keyboards. Once again, let's go to the plus sign to add a new track. Click on software instrument. This time I'm going to keep my library open. And I'm going to use this selected piano. Vintage electric piano is the category, and then classic electric piano is the sound. I double click it and it loads, and I could close the library. For our sake, let's pretend that we don't have a MIDI keyboard and we still need a way to play this electric piano. Well, don't worry, we could go to the top, go to window, and go to show musical typing, which will bring up this window that allows me to use the computer keys to play the electric piano. So let's perform some of that with the drummer track. We're going to do that by first returning our cursor to zero by either clicking and dragging it, or you could use the return key to bring it back to the beginning. I'm going to make sure that this one, two, three, four count in is clicked on so that we get a count in in the beginning. And I'm also gonna make sure that I have a click to play along with by clicking on this metronome. Now, if I click record, I could play my piano part. That was not my best performance on a keyboard ever, but let's clean it up really quickly. I'm gonna to return to the first bar by hitting return, and I'm gonna double click this region. I can now come down here, select all of my notes by clicking and dragging, or click in this box and hit command A. I'm gonna use time quantize to quickly quantize all my notes, and now they'll sound like they're in time. Much better, but we'll get more into that in a later video. For now, let's turn off our count-in, turn off the metronome, and I've decided I want to speed up my tempo. Well, this is easy to do. I could either double-click and type in a new tempo, or I could click and drag the tempo up or down. I also have a few different options here in terms of how I want to view my display. By clicking this triangle, I could select beats and time, I could select just to see my beats in the measure, or I could select time to see how many minutes and seconds I am into my piece. I'm gonna keep it on beats and time. And now let's take a look at how to mix our music. So very easily, we can mix our music with this slider here. These are our volume sliders. We also have the ability to solo and mute tracks. When you click this little headphone called solo, you'll only hear that one track. When you click mute, you'll mute that track. So solo and mute could be very important when you're auditioning different tracks. Let's see how the volume sliders work, and additionally, let's also take a look at the pan feature. The pan will put each of our tracks in our stereo field from left to right. So let's return to our first bar by hitting return, and let's make some adjustments to the volume and pan. Okay, those were kind of some odd adjustments, but you get the point. Now you notice that we got to the end of our song and it just stops. But what if we wanted it to loop over and over and over again? We could either click at this top ruler and draw on a cycle range, as you see by this yellow line. We could turn that off by clicking on that yellow line, or we could click the cycle button here at the top. You'll notice the letter C also turns that on and off. Let's just have our cycle, cycle only measures one and two. I'd like to record a vocal introduction to my keyboard and drum track. But what I'd like to do is move all my tracks so that I have one full measure up front. Let's do this by clicking and dragging to select our measures, and then just drag them over one measure. Now you can see that our tracks don't start until measure number two. Let's go back up into our voice and record a voice track. By double clicking on the voice track, I can see my recording settings. I'm going to want to make sure that my voice is coming in at a nice strong signal. And you can see here on the top voice part that my voice is pretty strong. It's never hitting the red. If I find that it's hitting the red, 
that means it may be entering clipping, which can add some distortion. And I could just bring my record level down right here. If I feel like it's not strong enough, I could bring it up here. You could use the internal microphone and speakers on your computer to record into GarageBand and listen back, but most people will have an audio interface that's separate, and these can range anywhere from $100 up to many thousands of dollars. Why would you want a separate audio interface? Typically, it'll give you better conversion, meaning it'll take your audio signal and convert it into the DAW with a better sound quality. On top of that, it'll give you a little more control over what you could do. This one features four inputs for microphones. That same input could also be used for guitar. For you, if you're just getting started, a single input on your interface is probably enough. If you find that you're gonna be using more than one mic at a time, you'll need to get more than one input. I'm going to suggest that anytime you record using a microphone, whether it's the internal microphone on your MacBook, or a USB microphone or one that you use with an interface that you make sure to use headphones. By doing this, you'll eliminate the possibility of feedback, which is a high-pitched screeching sound or a whistling sound. There is a feedback protection button, which tries to eliminate feedback, but you're better off just using headphones. And if you want to monitor your signal, meaning hear your voice as you're recording, just click here where it says input monitoring, and you can see that when it's lit up, you'll be able to hear your voice. Now I'm gonna go and record a quick vocal introduction. Hey everyone, check out my track. Now at this point, we're obviously very far from having a fully polished track, but let's pretend that we set our volume levels, we set some different panning, we feel that everything's sitting really well, we look at our master volume up here, and we notice that the master volume's pretty good. So what we need to do is we need to set an endpoint for our song. Let's take this zoom slider here on the top right, and if you're zoomed in too far, you may want to zoom out so that you could see your entire track. You'll notice that there's a little triangle here on the top right, and we could set our endpoint. I'm going to put my endpoint right up to the end of that piano track. I would now like to export my track, and I'm going to go to the top, hit share, export song to disk. I'm going to call this one test track. First, I want to set my track to export to the desktop. That seems like a best place for me. I'm also going to select to export it as an MP3 so that I could easily email it to people. In the case that you're asked to provide somebody with a higher resolution file, such as an AIFF, you could come down here and select a 16-bit CD quality or a 24-bit quality. My recommendation is to keep it at 24, but ask the person that you're sending the file to what they prefer. Now, before we finally wrap up our session, there's one important thing we forgot to do, and we probably should have done it earlier on, which is to go up to the top and select Save. Your GarageBand projects will reside in a GarageBand folder by default. Once again, I'll call this test project, and I could save it wherever I want on my hard drive. I'm gonna save it to the desktop so it's easy to find. Always keep track of where you put your files so they're easy to find later on. Let's hit save. Now, if I close this project, it'll bring us right back to where we started, but notice there's something new. If I go to recent, there's our project that we recently created. Getting started with GarageBand may seem a little confusing at first, but it's actually pretty easy. If you didn't get everything in this tutorial, go back and watch it again. And if you feel like maybe it was a little easy, we have a bunch more tutorials coming your way that are gonna get really in depth into microphone technique, recording guitars, editing, drummer regions, and much more.